Okay, so good morning everybody. This uh, um, today is our last lecture and I am uh, going to tackle with two arguments, the dynamics and the SUN fermions. So since uh, the time is a bit short, I propose that uh, um, we just to focus on the out of equilibrium dynamics. And if you want to know about uh, small oscillations, we will, uh, well, I can give you some references or uh, I can answer some questions this afternoon. Otherwise, I am afraid we will not have time for the SU and fermions, which is also a, a very nice topic. So, okay. So, um, what we have, what we know so far is we, if we have an homogeneous uh, bosons at strong interactions, so in the limit G to infinity, in homogeneous means trapped, harmonic trap, lattice, disorder, whatever. Then we have a first scene that the ground state solution is due to Marvin Girardot and it treats, so this is the many body wave function for the Bose gas, psi x1 xn is the product for j smaller than l, some sine of xj minus xl, so this is our mapping function A times the uh, wave function of a non-interacting Fermi gas in the same potential. And this one can be built in terms of single particle orbitals, you remember, is one over a square root of the, fa the n factorial of the determinant of some single particle orbitals in a given potential, so J and K are labels going one to n, and I have n bosons. Okay, so this is the solution for the ground state, and it follows from what we call the, the Bose-Fermi mapping. That is, we have shown that um, in the limit uh, of infinite interaction, the cusp condition implies that the wave function must vanish at contact. For any pair i and j, the wave function must vanish. And this is ensured by this function. And instead, uh, uh, so this we call a. And however, this function has not the right symmetry when we exchange the particles. And this mapping function ensures that uh, psi b of uh, xi xj is equal to psi b of xj xi when I exchange any pairs of particles i and j. Okay, so this is the basis. I have also rapidly mentioned that uh, in the um, case of finite temperature, so that was the ground state, at a finite temperature, the Bose-Fermi mapping can be extended. It's called thermal Bose-Fermi mapping. And in this case, if I want to describe um, in, uh, is the system, I have to introduce a, a thermal density matrix, and this density matrix can be written as the sum over some statistical weights, W of alpha n, n, and the sum over all possible particle numbers and all the possible quantum states for that given quantum number, and then uh, the density matrix is just this uh, alpha n n, alpha n n. And, uh, and for a thermal state, the W, you know from thermodynamics, are exponential y, uh, x minus beta, the many body energy E of uh, the state alpha n minus n times the chemical potential. This is in the grand canonical ensemble, and of course, it's divided by the partition function z, that is the sum over n and alpha n of these terms, e to minus beta, e minus mu n, okay? 
So in the case of a finite temperature toxic Girardot gas, uh, what, uh, okay, so then we want to calculate an observable O, expectation value. This will be the trace of rho O, and then we can calculate it using this expression, and we get expectation value of the observable O is the sum over n and alpha n of this uh, alpha n O alpha n. Of course, this is just a and time, times W alpha alpha n n. So this is just a definition. And now the mapping states that for each state alpha n, for each bosonic state alpha n, I can write it as mapped with an operator A to a fermionic state. And hence, when I want to calculate this expectation value of this observable, I, am, I have to treat this type of terms, sum of n alpha n, the corresponding statistical weight, and then I have the fermionic state, a to the minus one, O a alpha n fermionic. So this is the rule to calculate the, proper, the, the thermodynamical properties and all the finite temperature correlation functions for a tungsten Girardot gas. So now you see if O is the density operator, then the density operator commutes with the mapping function. We have seen it yesterday, so two days ago. And uh, then since O, uh, since N commutes with A, then we can immediately see that the expectation value of the density corresponds to the density of a Fermi gas, because we also have that uh, uh, A or inverse A applied twice is the identity. Okay, so while we have also seen that other, we cannot get rid of this A for, uh, for example, for the, uh, so if O equal N, then expectation value of N of the density is the same as the one of a Fermi gas. And we have also seen that this is not the case uh, if O is the uh, first order correlation function Psi dagger x, psi y. So, um, so that means that in that case you have really to take care of all these mapping function and to perform the sums, etc. And uh, um, now uh, it would take so it would be just a course on itself uh, to expand on this idea and to arrive to. Um, to the a final expression for these observables, but I can tell you that the method is similar to what we have seen at zero temperature in the first uh, in the second lecture. So I will not uh, detail it here, but essentially it's the same type of tricks, and you can arrive to the one-body density matrix at finite temperature in terms of n-body density matrices at finite temperature of a Fermi gas. And this is, uh, um, so essentially in this way, you can explore a broad class of problems, all, that you, all the uh, correlation function that you want to calculate at finite temperature can be uh, uh, calculated in an exact way. And again, you can use this to benchmark other approximated pro approaches at, uh, 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 at finite interactions or uh, to test um, a numerical simulation, for example. This is also very useful. Okay, so um, then we, uh, now we know the thermal Bose Fermi mapping and I would like now to attack the third class of uh, solutions that are those at, uh, for time dependent problems. But do you have questions before I move to time dependence? No? Okay. Then, uh, 
here. So let me stress that the time dependence phenomena are particularly difficult to describe uh, in quantum mechanics. So the study of uh, out of equilibrium quantum dynamics is one of the most challenging problems in general. Uh, of course, uh, um, so we do not have uh, an exact solution in almost any case. Here I am going to present you one case where we have an exact solution. So, and so I am going to uh, tell you what is the uh, um, time dependent Bose Fermi mapping. In fact, uh, you may now start to guess how it works. So, in fact, uh, for, uh, the, let's uh, state the problem. We want to solve uh, uh, the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Psi is uh, a, a general many body wave function, which now depends on time. And we went just to solve the Schrodinger equation, i d over dt of psi is equal to h psi, where in h we have the kinetic part for the bosons of mass m. We have an external potential that can be time dependent Important is it is the same applied to all the particles. And then we have interactions, so G, delta of xj minus xl for j smaller than l. Okay, so now if we send G to infinity, my claim is that we can solve exactly this equation. And uh, how to do that? Well, first of all, we notice that uh, for any time, for each t, the cusp condition must be satisfied. Um, then, how do I do that? Well, for example, I see that the Slater determinant imposes the cusp condition automatically. And then you can guess the solution is actually very close to ground state one. And we can try that if we build a time dependent wave function in this way, the same as the static one, we have the mapping function A, and then we build the Slater determinant of time dependent orbitals. And this here, are the solution of the one body problem, phi j equal h naught phi j, where this h naught is the one body Hamiltonian corresponding to that one, uh, h bar square over 2m, plus the external potential that is time dependent, then, and I, I imposed as initial condition uh, an in, uh, for a zero time, a comfortable one. For example, I can choose that this is the phi j of z of, uh, let's say the j's eigenvector of solution of this potential. If I want to start from uh, of, a, or a, of a given potential, uh, then by combining these three, I plug into here. I will apply the mapping function, and this is the solution of the many-body Schrodinger equation. This was also demonstrated by Marvin Girardo, but much later, around the year 2000. Yes? Yes? Do we have a reverse uh, mapping in order to be able to describe every sign of J when we know the bosonic state and not the permanent state of people 
Yes, yes, you can read the mapping in the two ways. So in, indeed, that is, uh, you, you decide from which state you start at g equals zero in terms of fermionic orbitals, and then you evolve each of those orbitals, and then this allows you to construct the solution of the many body uh, wave function at all the times. And notice this is also true for long times. And this is also true for uh, um, any type of perturbation. So also strongly out of equilibrium. And uh, uh, both, uh, both types of, uh, uh, both conditions are not usually found. For example, to go at long times in the numerics, you know that you accumulate errors. And then if you go to very, very long times, at some point you're not anymore so sure about the numerical solution. And when you are strongly out of equilibrium, sometimes it's difficult to, to describe the system with other methods. For example, you cannot uh, apply a linear response. Okay, or uh, so for this reason, this solution is uh, really very useful. And now I am going to show you uh, one example of this uh, application of this method to study what we call the dynamical fermionization. Yes. Yes. On the, the J is not um, um, no, I think you should do with your numerics to do the calculation at uh, up the largest time you can go for a given G, and then you go for another G, and then you see how it, uh, your numerical solution will or not approach to this one that we have. Uh, you, this is a sort of a reference solution, and then you can uh, look at the difference between the numerical solution and this one. It, yes. Um, the, this, uh, uh, the time dependence centers in the fermionic part. Yes. And here, no, because it's enough to take the same uh, and it works. Yes, thanks for the question. Okay, so um, let's see how it works on this example. Yes. Ah, yeah, so actually Girardot proves it in three lines. It just says that uh, if we try with this and we plug onto the many body Schrodinger equation, you see that when you replace the interaction by the cusp, then uh, uh, you ensure the cusp condition by the fact that this, this times this, this has the right nodes and this has the right symmetry under exchange of particles. There could, maybe the mathematicians have a more uh, advanced uh, demonstration, but uh, in, uh, uh, let's say, in uh, our case, uh, we think, let's say, it's enough by substitution. So actually, uh, for strongly out of equilibrium dynamics, you can think of quenches, for example, or you can think of uh, driven systems. So you can uh, uh, strongly shake the gas and see what happens, or uh, you can uh, make a sudden change of conditions and then look at the evolution. And actually, our method allows us to give the answer of what happens at very long times. So for example, uh, will it thermalize, will it not thermalize, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So in fact, the example I'm going to give you is an example of a quench. 
sudden quench of the external potential. Um, unfortunately, we cannot treat the quenching interactions for this method because our solution is only valid at infinite interactions. But we can treat this type of, of quenches. So um, we, uh, we start from uh, an external potential that uh, at uh, uh, time zero is, uh, uh, one, is an harmonic potential at uh, time uh, smaller or equal to zero. And uh, it goes, uh, well, we can do two options. It goes to zero for time larger than zero, or it goes to another uh, trapping potential with a different frequency at time larger than zero. Essentially, with the same type of solution, we can treat both cases. So this is a sudden trap opening in a one-dimensional direction. So here, uh, at time zero, you have uh, the, the bosons in a, some given trap, and that uh, this was at time zero, and at time larger than zero, you turn off the trap, and the bosons, uh, so then it will become dashed, it's not anymore there, and uh, uh, the bosons will expand more and more, but only in one dimension. This is different from one, what you can do in a um, cold atom experiment where you can also sudden turn off the trap in all the dimension. And then the, the gases will uh, rather expand uh, transversally where they were very much confined and not so much longitudinally. Here, we keep the transverse confinement on and we do a 1D expansion. The other reason is that if we turn all the type of confinement at the same time, in fact, we can neglect the effect of interaction most of the times so during the expansion, while in one dimensional expansion, we should not, and we see that uh, the interactions play a role at all times. Okay, so how do I solve this problem? I take my recipe. The recipe is uh, to use uh, the, um, the time-dependent Bose Fermi mapping. So uh, first of all, I have to solve the single particle problem corresponding to this, uh, to this type of change of potential. And uh, well, um, the nice thing of this problem is that there is uh, um, an exact solution that is uh, easy to write. So in fact, the solution is uh, due to uh, Perelomov and Popov. But maybe you, can, you could have also guessed yourself, eh? I don't. In fact, the solution is done by scaling. It's actually quite simple and interesting to keep in mind if you have to study quenches of this type. So the um, we start, let's say, we start at time zero by filling our Fermi sphere for bosons. That is uh, the phi j of zero is the level, is the, is the solution of uh, H naught phi, phi j equal epsilon j phi j. Is the eigenstate of the, of the Hamiltonian with the trap. And then the time evolution of this state under the sudden trap opening is done by introducing a scaling parameter B that we will determine. And then the solution by Perelomov and Popov says that at all the time, uh, the phi j scales like one over square root of B. This is just for normalization. Phi j of x over b zero, so it has the same shape as the initial time one. I just rescale the coordinate by b, and then it acquires a phase, and this phase is a dynamical phase, has this form, m over two h bar 
x squared times the b dot over b, so this is the time derivative of b, minus epsilon j, and then tau of t is a rescaling of the, ta of the time coordinate. Okay, so if you take this one and you plug into the Schrodinger equation, you see that the Schrodinger equation is satisfied at all times, provided that uh, b of t uh, satisfies an equation of motion that is of this form, so second derivative of b with respect to time, plus uh, the uh, trapping frequency omega square. Okay, so I put it omega square of t to mean that it is either zero or omega one, but it's not actually itself time dependent for our specific case, equal omega zero square over b cube. And similarly, one can show that uh, the rescaling of the time is given by integral from, from zero of t in the t prime, one over uh, b square of t prime. So if I um, use this, the problem is completely solved because we have the time dependent orbitals at all times, and then we can calculate the properties of this gas. And uh, so let's. Uh, And now it would have been almost an exercise, but I want to show you how it uh, finishes. <laughs> yes? In the system, we consider that dx is zero for the time of zero. Then you just have b dot dot and omega zero squared by the like cube. Uh, yes. Okay. So and the solution in that case is uh, uh, so for the case one. The solution is b over t, one plus uh, omega zero square b square, uh, sorry, uh, t square. <laughs> and in the case two, it's a slightly more complicated expression. Case two, uh, b over t is uh, uh, similar, but not exactly one plus um, the difference of the two frequencies, square, but divided by omega one square times sinus square of uh, omega one t. And uh, is the, uh, First and second case here, it's better if I... So this is uh, case one. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, uh, sorry, sorry. I, but I didn't, uh, I just said I didn't write. So we can solve both at the same time, in fact, because... So um, as a comment, then this B of T is the sort of the width of the cloud. And you see that the... Uh, this, uh, yeah, go back to this blackboard. So the, the B is the typical, the B is the typical size here, which depends on time. And uh, what is not, okay, what is interesting and non-trivial is not only the, the wave packet spread, but also acquires the, fa the phase. Yes? Yes, B is a dimensionless parameter that it uh, is B is equal to one at time zero is the initial and then it grows. It's a sort of a ratio of initial size to. Yes, right. Okay, so then uh, thanks to uh, this expression for each orbital, we can uh, write immediately the many body wave function. 
Psi just by plugging in that solution and we get one over uh, b to the power and half, just a prefactor, and then we get uh, that uh, this is equal to the one at zero. And then I get this phase that is the sum over all the phases. And uh, now, for, for uh, practicity, I have written it in terms of the in-dimensionless form for the coordinates. So I write uh, in terms of x in units of harmonic oscillator length square is the same as before. And then uh, the, also that part of the phase, the sum over j, epsilon j, tau of t. Nothing. You could have done that as well. Uh, yes, but this is uh, um, simpler somehow for me. Yes, yes, right. You, you, yes, 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 you could do that way. But in this way, I can show you uh, that I can connect the um, solution at uh, long times to the one of time zero because of this scaling. Uh, sorry, there was a, a typo in my equation. So uh, this is zero. So somehow then when I want to calculate the correlation functions for this wave function, I have them in terms of this and some phases, so it's quite practical. Uh, yeah, so omega square of t is a bad notation for uh, either, uh, so uh, omega of t is uh, uh, this, so in, as a function of time, Either it is uh, here uh, omega zero and here zero, or uh, here omega zero and here omega one. Is, uh, well, I could have just written omega one uh, square or zero, yes. Because I was trying to treat all the cases at the same time. And of course I could use, uh, uh, so this is a case where it's, it's simple to, to find the final expression for the differential equation, but if you want uh, other type of uh, omega of t, you, it's also included. T from zero on, okay. but using, if I could have put just uh, zero. Oh, yes, yes. And you had a question. A harmonic oscillator is uh, uh, square root of uh, is the typical uh, length scale for the harmonic oscill initial harmonic oscillator. Is zero? I would say. Yes. Mm. Okay, so now if I um, use this solution and I plug it, I can calculate uh, um, observables. So, so the one I want to look at uh, is as the one which I've been uh, studying in all the previous lecture, is the one body density matrix as a function of time. So this one uh, would be the Time, so which corresponds in second quantization of just this psi dagger of xt, psi of yt. So same time uh, correlation function, but since it is a quench, that means that it is time dependent. In a system where nothing, uh, which is time translational invariant, it would be the same as the time equals zero, but here since we changed something at time zero, this quantity depends on time, right? And so, um, 
now that I have defined it, let me calculate it in first quantization. And uh, it's the same definition that we used last time, is the integral in the n prefactor in the x2 in the xn of this uh, psi star of y x2 xn t times psi of x x2 xn t. Then I plug in this solution and then I, uh, okay, and, and, and then I see that uh, some of these phases will cancel between the psi star and the psi. Those will depend on the coordinate x2 to xn. You see that they are the same, so it will cancel because one is psi, uh, psi star, the other psi. But I have one phase that is remaining, is the one where here I have y and here I have x. So this gives n and then I have, I keep one over b here separate from the rest. I have dx to dxn, then psi uh, star of y x to xn times zero psi of x xj times zero, I, just to, to put a shorthand notation for x to xn. And then I have this extra phase e to the i b dot over 2b omega naught. And then I have um, minus y square minus x square over the harmonic oscillator length. Sorry, it's a bit written. Uh, sorry? I just plug in this into this definition and make a change of variable. Yes, so sorry, yes, this is. Yes, thanks. Okay, now the question is fine. And I hope you can read here the phases uh, is a bit uh, written in a <laughs> No, no, here are the, I just plug in this and then I, I get onto that. So, and then you recognize that this, if I go back to the usual variables, that this is the one body density matrix at time zero. And then I have this phase. <coughs> x over b, y over b, then I, get, I have a factor 1 over b in front, and then I have this uh, extra phase here that is uh, also in, the, in front. Okay, now uh, with this uh, relatively simple expression, we can calculate the momentum distribution, and this will yield So the momentum distribution is the Fourier transform of the above, and we get the um, integral in the x, integral in the y, and then I replace, I have this uh, 1 over b, row 1 of x over b, y over b, 0, exponential of minus i b over b dot over 2b omega naught, then the coordinate uh, y over harmonic oscillator minus x square, and then exponential e to the minus i k x minus y. 
So now, or, now you see that this phase is uh, rapidly oscillating and growing with time because we have uh, that B of, uh, B of T, it's, uh, um, ah, sorry, I have another B, I'm, I apologize. I, yes, okay. Um, now I want to um, have that all the variables depend on, on in over B the same way, so I multiply and divide by uh, b square. Okay, so now all the variables can be rewritten in terms of some uh, uh, tilde variable, x over b and uh, y over b. And uh, if I uh, look at the long, so then, uh, um, okay, I don't want to re I, I hesitate. Okay, I will rewrite it explicitly. B. I, it's probably simple for you, eh? but in this way you see immediately the final expression. And then I get these phases e to the minus exponential. Let's write bigger. And then I have a minus IB b dot over omega zero square, and then I have this uh, x tilde square minus y tilde square over two harmonic oscillator square minus i k um, b x tilde minus y tilde. Okay, so, uh, now you see that uh, this b grows with time. That means that in this integral, uh, the phase is oscillating faster and faster. And you know how to solve this problem in general is by the stationary phase method. And by the stationary phase method, we get that uh, um, the uh, x and y coordinate minimize the phase are the same and are equal, so proportional to k. So if you do the exercise, you get the x tilde star is y tilde star is uh, omega zero over harmonic oscillator length square k divided by b dot. Um, okay, so that means that when we look at the long time behavior of n of k, k, t going to infinity. This is written in terms of the row one of x tilde star, y tilde star zero, times some factor, some prefactor, the prefactor, and uh, proportional, let's say. And since x and y tilde star are the same, that means this corresponds to the um, density profile of a Fermi gas at as a function of k, which actually is the same as the momentum distribution of a Fermi gas. And f of omega zero k over b dot. So this shows that the Momentum distribution of a Bose gas at long times tends to the momentum distribution of a Fermi gas, initial Fermi gas in a harmonic trap. And that's what we call the dynamical fermionization. And uh, first of all, uh, this can be generalized because in general you can show that it tends to the rapidity density of the gas, but this is the work of Jerome. So 
if you have questions, please ask him. And uh, um, secondly, this, uh, let me uh, take a picture, so make a picture for that. So initially the momentum distribution is like that. We have seen it last time. It has a peak, it has some tails, k to the minus four. At long times, we see that it tends to a momentum distribution that it has this shape here. So this is the momentum distribution of a Fermi gas in a harmonic trap. So where are the tails? The tails are also there, but they're tiny. We cannot lose the tails, you see, because at all the times we have the cusp. So the tails will be there, but it will suppress more and more for, uh, for long times. They are not vanishing. Um, yes, and uh, let me mention that this has been, uh, of, uh, so this was our prediction uh, in 2005, but, and it was later measured in experiments much, much later, I think in 2021, in the group of David Weiss. And uh, um, if you uh, do the case two, the case where you do not completely open the trap, you have uh, large amplitude breathing modes where the momentum distribution changes from this one to this one and vice versa. So you have uh, that, the sort of defocusing and refocusing of the momentum distribution. And you can ask is actually what is this state at long times? Is it, uh, why, that, so it tends to something, but how do we characterize this something to which it tends? And this was the beginning of a huge field where it was demonstrated that, the, that this type of uh, dynamical evolution bring to the so-called generalized Gibbs ensemble. And this, uh, I mean, would be require a course on its own. So, but uh, this is just one example where we have that this, uh, um, is uh, um, we see that it tends sort to a steady state, and it was demonstrated that this is not a thermal state, but you can characterize it by using all the um, integrals of motion of a, of a Bose gas, of an interacting Bose gas. Not yet. It's a very interesting problem. I think we can write it down. But uh, is, what you can do is you can uh, do the same sudden quench at finite temperature. This was studied by uh, Dimitri Gangard, Isabel Bouchoul. Yes? Yes, it can, uh, so not the Perelomov and Popov scaling, this is a specific for, but uh, you can do the time dependent with the Fermi mapping. And actually this was done, for example, by Maxime Olshani and Marcus Rigol. That's where they introduced the concept of generalized Gibbs ensemble and they were using this setup. Oh, sorry, you have, uh, um, you have uh, initially the gas trapped in a small box and then uh, you let it expand in a bigger box. So this you can do as well. It's quite uh, general. And uh, let me uh, mention that in the case two, um, we see uh, then this oscillation of the momentum distribution, and we see there is uh, uh, nowhere damping of the oscillation. So these oscillations in the limit of infinite interaction are can, co can go on forever in our model. So this is quite surprising because you change very much the state of the system, but still it oscillates for a long time, for infinitely long time. So uh, this here is an example of something that is uh, not true at finite interaction. We expect that if the interactions are not infinite, you will have a, a damping which would vanish 
at uh, infinite interaction. This is also the object of study of uh, like uh, of the recent years uh, in the, the dynamics at long times uh, and uh, this dumping kernel. No, also in case, uh, sorry, uh, this, uh, when we tend the uh, time to infinity, yes. For case two, it is, uh, is uh, you see that um, if the frequencies are very different, so this indeed, this is case one. Uh, for case two, uh, let me make another picture. For case two, what you will have is that you start from this momentum distribution, then it will uh, sort of become like that, and then back like that, and so on. Yes. And so on. So, it's large amplitude oscillations. Yes? Um, well, we have this has the advantage that you can essentially do on a blackboard. If you have a smooth turning uh, on or off, which is actually what it can happen in an experiment, you have to solve the time depends the one body Schrodinger equation by describing how you turn off the potential, and then you plug it in, and uh, well. So, but it's uh, it's easy to do, except that you have to do a bit of uh, simple uh, solution of differential equations numerically. How far out of equilibrium is uh, at a given time? Huh? Yeah. Um, um, well, you can always calculate the fidelity with respect to uh, the equilibrium state, for example. This you can do, so you can... Uh, um, we have not done that, in fact, but it's, I believe it's also an, another nice calculation to do. <laughs> Right. Finite G. Uh, yeah. So I I would say no. They ha they are very careful to to check that they, they do not occupy transverse states that they can know somehow by looking at the shape of the cloud. Uh, but indeed, it has been, I would say, a very difficult experiment. Okay, but it was infinity and also G. Ah, yeah, what happens if time is not really infinity? Yeah, you see that. Uh, uh, what is the time scale to form this? Uh, this is of the order of the inverse of the Fermi energy of the system. So. So, in fact, as you can solve not only for time to infinity, you can solve for all times. Then you can see that at intermediate times you still have a slightly bigger tails, but, and then you start to, to form in the central part this, but it can be checked as well. So, ah, yes? Yes. Ah, if you squeeze, yeah. yes, nice question as well. You also have oscillations, large amplitude, of the type of that type, case two. And, uh, um, well, qualitatively the same, maybe the details is that, so instead, the width of the typical width of the cloud it will in, uh, incre decrease and, in, uh, so let's say, if I would plot, uh, the typical width of the cloud as a function of time. In this case, where I decrease the omega, the uh, width increases, so it will do things like that, in, while in the other case, it will be something like that.
Yes. Do we have a fixed behavior as uh, omega uh, uh, I don't know. Never tried that one. But it's a sort of, uh, well, sort of squeezing a lot the cloud. Well, we should think whether it's uh, really feasible. Uh, could be a singular limit. But I agree that theoretically is worth. Uh, Okay, so I propose that even if this uh, lecture was a bit shorter, this part, we make the break now, so then we have a bit longer uh, session on uh, SU and fermions. So, meet in uh, 10 minutes. So I think we can uh, restart. Okay, so in this uh, very last part of my course, we are going to attack the SUN fermions. So first of all, let me define what the model, because uh, you had uh, some questions at the first lecture on the, about the model. So we consider, um, just a second, we consider a Fermi gas with M components. Each component has an M particle. So the total uh, number of fermions is N1 plus N2 plus etc. etc. NM. And then for uh, um, example, for M equal to the two components can be labeled by a spin. So we can call them up and down. And for M larger than two, we uh, think of colors or so some uh, uh, that are originating from some uh, internal atomic structure of the atoms. And actually this is the case for some uh, al al alkali atoms like the terbium or strontium all these have lots of uh, internal levels. So six for terbium, um, for strontium, I don't want to say the wrong number, but it's also large. And uh, the other thing that we, so this is a Fermi gas. So then, uh, uh, yeah, the other uh, convention is that uh, the first uh, uh, chord, N, the first uh, M coordinates belong to N1. So x and one, then uh, the, the second uh, um, color, we start from x and one plus one, two, et cetera. And uh, so it's just a convention, which particle has which coordinate. Um, what else I want to say before we start? We take the limit g going to infinity of interaction strength between the Fermi gases belonging to different components. So interaction strength is uh, sum over J and L of some G delta of XJ minus XL. And I can write it with J and L running from one to N. So let's write it like that, from one to N. I add extra fictitious delta interaction between uh, particles be belonging to the same species, but it has no effect because there the wave function will vanish. So I can write it in this very general form. But in essence, you have to think that in fact the collisions that take place are those below to fermions belonging to different components. And all the interactions are the same, like uh, G blue red is equal to G yellow white equal to, or G up up equal to G up down, G uh, and so on. Um, then we take fermions, that is that when we have, uh, for example, two particles belonging to the same uh, uh, color, for a given color, the wave function changes sign when I exchange them, like for spin polarized fermions. However, what I don't know is what happens when I exchange 
two coordinates belonging to two different colors. This I have to determine. I don't know. Is it in the same spirit as the Bete Ansatz? Okay, now there is uh, um, another, uh, so an important feature when we have a multi component system is that in the trap, because we are going also to add the trap, this is the specificity of our uh, exact solutions, um, the ground state has uh, some degeneracy. So, before, for bosons, I wrote a single ground state wave function. You didn't, uh, you didn't suspect, there is but it's true, there is just one single ground state for bosons. But for uh, multi-component fermions and also multi-component bosons, the ground state is degenerate. And this is uh, due to the fact that uh, take two distinguishable particles, uh, and solve the two-body problems as a function of interaction strength. It's a bit what we have done already for the trap last time, but here we, we don't care uh, um, about the confinement for this specific part of the example. So, in fact, it turns out then for two particles, when I arrive at infinite interaction, I can imagine of two energy levels, of um, two types of states. One which is affected by the cusp, but you can always write another state that is the fully antisymmetric one, right? Just, uh, I can write, uh, in one case, uh, it is just a slater determinant of two particles. Uh, and in the other case, I can, uh, I can write a state with a cusp. And both have the same energy at infinite interaction. So you see that it is, in fact, a reality that even for two particles, the ground state is twice degenerate. If you have our multi-component mixture, the ground state degeneracy is associated to all the ways I can choose cusps or not cusps in the wave function. And the degeneracy is given by n factorial divided by n1 factorial, n m factorial. This is the degeneracy d of the ground state. So we have uh, to, to deal with this uh, degeneracy. And we want to write, yes? No. Agreed. Yes, yes, for two distinguishable particles. Yes, the dist is distinguishable. And but I agree, that's true. And uh, um, so now we want to describe the ground state manifold. So now, from now on, you have to think that we have manifolds of states quite dense, so they can have quite a large degeneracy. And the goal is to write the many body wave function in this degeneracy manifold. But beforehand, let me just say a word about the symmetry, because so, uh, because uh, um, it is uh, practical, in fact, to classify the symmetry of our degenerate manifold using the Young tableau. So just uh, uh, one word about uh, how to, uh, so, how to say which symmetry. the state has. So you, let's uh, focus for simplicity on the two component case, up and down. Um, you can always imagine that this type of methods that I am making, exemplifying for two, party, for two colors can be uh, straightforwardly extended to any dimension, to then any number of colors. For example, I take uh, two plus two fermions, two up, two down, then if I want to characterize the symmetry under exchange of particles for this, I can make young tableaus. Mm. 
That is, for example, I can construct a fully anti-symmetric state with four particles, and I will indicate it as a vertical uh, uh, tableau like that. This is uh, fully anti-symmetric. If I want to describe a state that is fully symmetric, it will be horizontal column, but this with uh, two plus two fermions I cannot do. The another, uh, another type of uh, state that I can do is this one. So I take, in, I anti-symmetrize uh, each uh, uh, two of them vertically, but I symmetrize horizontally. And uh, there is also this type of, uh, uh, I don't know, Tetris-like <laughs> tableau, <laughs> that is uh, where I anti-symmetrize, I anti-symmetrize this and I symmetrize this. So, in general, I, um, yes? Yes? The, the important is that I assure that uh, it is, uh, um, that I do not uh, symmetrize too much because it's impossible because it's fermions. But if I anti-symmetrize a bit more, it's not a problem. Yes. 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 Okay. So isn't it strange for me that they are both the same sort of particle? One is a space space with the space and symmetry, and the other one with the space. So in the way we write the, um, it's a very very nice question. In the way we write the wave function, uh, we um, write as it is a multi-component gas. So I do not write the spinors. So um, this is actually what is also done uh, in uh, several other models. But there is, um, a, there is another, uh, say, um, school of solution of these models that was done uh, in Hanover, where they write explicitly the spinor degree of freedom. It, there is, uh, in the end, uh, there is, uh, it's always possible to map one to the other somehow. But uh, here, say, it's multi-component, so it's colors. In, yes, yes, it's colors. Okay. Uh, I hope I will uh, answer at the very last uh, uh, today. I will show you this. Uh, I, I can. Uh, be, I start with the permutation. Let, let me answer. Give the idea. Then uh, you start with the uh, um, permutation symmetries, and then that's uh, uh, when you. Um, map onto effective, um, let's say, generalized spin Hamiltonian or color Hamiltonians, that's where you see that uh, what matters is the permutation, and then this way you represent these permutations on a given uh, uh, state, spin state, internal state, or symmetry state. So it's a permutation group, not a permutation group. Not um, permutation given the constraints that I have a multi-component. So I will end up to find, yeah, stay, I hope I will manage, I will explain, yes. Yes, I, um, is exactly what I wanted to show you now. So for two part, for this two plus two example, it is uh, useful to uh, represent the, the states in the, in the basis that I call the snippet basis. <coughs> that is the following. So, uh, in fact, uh, um, when I ex so I have uh, four spins like that. Uh, when I exchange these two, I know the relative sign of the wave function should be just a minus. So it's a um, it is uh, uh, something that I can embed already in this drawing, saying that I count, and also similarly for this one. So if I want to organize the, all the coordinates, so in principle I have to write the wave function on n factorial coordinate sectors, like in the Bete Ansatz, but out of these n factorial coordinate sectors, some of them are trivial. 
And then I write on a subset, on a smaller space. And this smaller space has the degenerate as a dimension d. And so this uh, snippet basis, so first of all, let me write. So, and this is uh, what you could imagine by writing all these uh, small arrows up, uh, um, down, down, up, for example, and the same with down. And then uh, down, down, up, up, down. So this is an example of a snip snippet basis for um, two plus two. And in fact, the degeneracy is four factorial divided by two factorial, two factorial, and this is six. And these are the six basis vectors in this space. And uh, mathematically, how do I write it in coordinate space? Is uh, uh, the following. I write it like that, for example, x1, x4 times this uh, um, snippet here, up, up, down, down, is uh, um, a set of thetas of the coordinate sectors. You remember we defined the coordinate sectors as being uh, uh, x1 smaller than x2, smaller than x3 smaller than x4, or another one, x2 smaller than x1, etc. And each coordinate sector is associated to a permutation of the particle, so this is the identity. And this is the one, if I write x3 smaller than x4, this one is the permutation of the particles so 1 and 2. So, uh, and when I write uh, theta of p, means uh, the uh, theta function that is non-zero only in a coordinate sector. So this uh, snippet here is written as theta of uh, identity plus the theta of p12 plus uh, theta of p34 plus uh, theta of P12, P34. So in uh, this one, uh, I exchange, uh, it is this sector here, and the last one is uh, x2 smaller than x1, smaller than x4, smaller than x3. Okay, so all that times the, uh, times the Fermi wave function of n free fermions. Okay, so this is uh, my notation for one of these uh, uh, elements of this basis. Um, en passant, let me mention that, uh, so here we are in the infinite interaction regime, and hence we can use a sort of generalized Girardot solution where we can start from uh, a huge slate de slater determinant of the n particles, where we exchange all the particles among them, and all are anti-symmetrized when we exchange. And on top of that, we fix the amplitudes of the wave function in a sort of bete ansatz uh, point of view. So in fact, uh, let me write the exact uh, solution for the wave function of the degenerate manifold as the follows. Actually, I, I say for the degenerate manifold, but it's valid for any manifold, but here we will only concentrate on the ground state manifold. So. exact solution. We write it like that. Psi psi of the multi-component mixture is uh, sum over all the permutations of the uh, Sn group of uh, um, some amplitudes AP, some uh, um, 
theta function projecting on, the, on a given coordinate sector associated to the permutation P times the fermionic wave function of n particles in the same external potential. So this is um, the most general solution. Um, we have, however, to fix the amplitudes AP. And let me mention that uh, here I have put in act the so-called fermionization of fermions. That is, uh, I map the initial multi-component mixture on a huge Fermi sphere. For example, for the four particle case, I need the four single particle levels. Although the spin up and down, in case of no interaction, I could have accommodated in the first two levels. Here it's not possible. Yeah, I have strongly repulsive interaction and I need four levels and a, a corresponding Slater determinant. So this, uh, um, many people tried to write uh, this, uh, uh, the solution for this problem. And uh, the right one was proposed in the group of Nikolai Zinner in 2014. So it's quite recent, all these uh, type of solutions. Yes? When right, looking at the exact solution, how do you know that I have a n component fermion uh, family? Because nothing is saying to me that you have n components inside of this formula. Not yet. That's where you are going to calculate these coefficients. Yeah, that's exactly where you are free, free to choose. In fact, if uh, instead you have one single component, uh, all spin polarized, then you know immediately the AP is just minus one to the P, and it is, so it's actually one because I have already the fermion here. And uh, so, however, when you have a different uh, number of components, you write differently this uh, AP. So then the trick, uh, yes? Yes. What, uh, what distinguishes the various different phases, the basic factors, are the combination of the theta cells. Yes. Uh, and uh, how do you make this uh, correspondence? What would change, for example, if you took another different uh, basic parameter? Ah, yes. Let me show you. So here, so, so in this case, we have uh, uh, four factorial, so 24. Uh, terms in the sum, uh, and uh, I want to, uh, and, I, I, and in fact I realize that I have only six equi uh, inequivalent uh, ordering of the spins on this uh, line. So that means that out of this 24 uh, coordinate sector, in fact I have uh, to group them in uh, six groups. And each group is associated to uh, the cases where I have uh, up and down in a given order. Remember that I have said that uh, N1, so for example, for 2 plus 2, N1, the, the, the up particles will have coordinate x1, x2, the down particles x3, x4. Okay, so then now, if I uh, want to describe this snippet here, will be one where, for example, one coordinate sector will be x3, smaller than x1, smaller than x4, smaller than x2, for this one. Okay, but you could also equivalently include, in this, all time you exchange three with four and one with two. And this has four cases. And then uh, that's how you attach uh, to the snippet uh, each time uh, four coordinate sectors. And then, uh, it, and then you can uh, um, normalize such that uh, two snippets uh, have a uh, norm one, but this is just a, a combinatorial factor that you add. Uh. Yes, I think so, it's more clear. Okay, so how to find these coefficients here? Uh, then the trick is to uh, look at the, uh, to, uh, to, to do a strong coupling expansion. And uh, in particular, I want to know what is, are the coefficients for the uh, 
for the state, which would be the ground state at finite interactions. So I had made before the drawing of two particles where we had a, two, a degeneracy of two. If I have more than two particles, like here I have six, so you have to imagine that I have uh, the energy as a function of minus one over G, the interaction strength would have this shape at a strong coupling in one over G. And now the, the ground state is the one where if I decrease the interaction, is the, it's this one, which has the largest slope, right? So then the way to find these uh, coefficients is to, for the ground state is to impose that uh, uh, if I look at the energy of the state in one over G, it has the largest slope. And, it, and so uh, I write the energy as the energy at uh, infinite interaction, E at infinity, and then I do plus one over G, DE, and D uh, one over G. And then I calculate this for G equal infinity. So this is just a Taylor expansion around the point uh, G equal infinity. And uh, by the way, look at this. This is something we have studied in the second lecture. This was related to the Tanz contact. So somehow the way of calculating these coefficients is related to the way we calculate the Tanz contact over this system. It's everywhere, the Tanz contact. So actually, in order to calculate uh, this, and to, in order to find the coefficient, I just plug the many body wave function in the expansion of the energy in order one over G. And remember that when I have to calculate DE over D one over G, this is of course minus G square DE over DG. And for that, I use the Hellman Feynman theorem to calculate it as minus g square psi dh over dg psi with the psi given state. And since the Hamiltonian had some kinetic part plus g times the terms with the deltas. When I derive with respect to G, it means that I get this term here, the sum over the deltas. And this then shows that uh, this is minus G square integral in the X2, the Xn, and then uh, uh, the sum of J smaller than L of these deltas, and then the, uh, the state of the system. And the state, of course, is made of uh, sectors. Well, let's write it, psi star of x1, xn, psi of x1, xn. So you see that when I substitute this sum over p, um, actually, ah, let me make a simplification step. As I, we introduced the snippets, <laughs> Um, this can also be written, this sum, can also be written on, on another index, Q, of, uh, well, the coefficients will be the same, but here I put the uh, snippet basis. Uh, EQ. And this sum goes only from one to D, which is smaller than N factorial. So in other words, I can uh, represent the same wave function in a smaller uh, basis uh, uh, set. Because I took already into account uh, in the snippet the, the rest of the permutation. Okay. So I am going, when I, um, 
take this expression and I plug it into here, I, um, you see that uh, I get uh, this time, I, I get uh, all sorts of types of terms, but in particular, I get a G square times the wave function. And that means that I can replace, and then I have a delta here, I can use the CASP condition to, uh, to calculate these integrals. And I will have all these terms AQ. So in the end, since we are a bit in short of time, I just put the final result, which will be the following. This will be, um, I use the CASP condition and I get h bar square, h bar to the form to the sum, m square, sum of j smaller than l, and then I get um, this type of integrals, delta of xj minus xl, and then the derivative of the wave function at contact, xj equal xl plus, minus the same for xj equal xl minus square, and all that in the end will uh, make appear, so for, a, for each coordinate sector, let me just give the idea, I write the wave function with different weights. Right? So when I have to calculate the derivative of the boundary between two coordinate sector, I get a different amplitudes AP entering. You see, every time I take the derivative, I have a finite slope, and I have the coefficient AP. So that means that the final type of form, general form, for this dE over dG is a sum over K and P uh, snippets, some weights alpha kp that are related to these integrals times ak minus ap square. And in these alphas, I have uh, explicit, I have uh, these uh, uh, many body integrals of these deltas and these derivatives of uh, uh, free fermions. Let me, it's maybe useful to write it nevertheless the alphas, alphas, um. and uh, by the way, if you look at that uh, uh, expression, you see that you need to calculate it differently depending on what type of mixture you have. So the alphas are the say, defined this way, is the integrals of dx1, dxn on a theta of, uh, okay, how to write it? Uh, uh, theta of uh, the permutation which corresponds of having um, the delta of xj minus xl. So, uh, just a second. With respect to x, I mean with respect to the relative coordinate of xj minus xl. So every time there is, uh, there are two derivatives hidden in only one. I wanted to, uh, to show you the, um, okay, I will write an example of alpha for a given, for our four component case. Um, because uh, the, uh, for example, when I, uh, because it's more explicit than writing all the possible labels and so on. So for example, when I had to calculate, for example, the integral of the delta of x2 minus x3 for our four component case, then I, I connect two sectors, the x1 is more than x2, three and four, with another one which has this shape, x3, x2, x4. So here I have exchanged up 
and up with down. And when I have this delta, then I have the corresponding alpha that is called the alpha uh, one, two, because it, it involves the snippet one with the snippet two, um, which is written as the integral of the remaining. So I have a delta of two minus three. So it's the integral in the x one, three and four of a, a, over a, a coordinate sector that is x1 smaller than x3 smaller than x4 because I have uh, eliminated the coordinate x2 by the delta. And then I have the derivative of a fermionic wave function square and uh, some h bar four over m square in prefactor and a factor four coming from the fact that we're using the fact that the wave function was the, the derivative was the same on the left and on the right of the cusp. So this is just to give an idea that if you have a fermionic wave function, you have some uh, integral to do on a given coordinate sector to give uh, the corresponding uh, parameters alpha. So these are a sort of inputs that we know and we are left to determine the, a, the amplitudes A. And the amplitude A, of course, are such that sum over K of all the amplitude square is one because we want the wave function to be normalized. Okay, so um, remember we decided that the ground state wave function is the one which has the largest slope. So we want to maximize this here we call kappa and we want to find the maximum of kappa at varying all the a's uh, such that the sum over k of a k square is equal to one. So Because uh, we used it in the cusp condition. We use one here and one there, and then we, we are replaced by h bar square over m square, the derivative. h bar square over m, the derivative for each of the two. Is the, I told you the cusp is the, really the core of this course. <laughs> Okay, so when you want to find the maximum of this quadratic form is actually the same or the inverse of finding the minimum when you want to find the solution of a ground state of a Hamiltonian that is quadratic. Well, you, you write it in, ter in the form of a matrix and you diagonalize the matrix and you find the, the largest or the smallest or the eigenvector. So in the end, the way to proceed is to write the The operative way to find the ground state is to write that k is uh, like a, a, a vector transposed, a matrix, a vector. This vector A means uh, A1 to AD, the coefficients of uh, the coefficients that we need in the wave function. And uh, we want to find, and if, if by diagonalizing the matrix M, which is a dimension D times D, we find the, uh, we take the largest eigenvalue, it will give us the largest slope, and its eigenvector will be, uh, this will, will, will give us the amplitudes AP for the ground state. And this is the best, uh, so it is a bit numerical, but not much. And it is the way to solve the ground state for the multi-component uh, mixtures. And uh, uh, how are we doing with the time? So then in uh, one word, 
let me, um, the, probably those of you who, who know uh, the, the integrable solutions, they, um, it reminds something, okay, let me, I want now to rewrite, recast this problem into uh, a spin or color problem to answer the question. And uh, this will be done here. And uh, by the way, uh, let me say that uh, once we have the vectors AP is the beginning of the, uh, of the study of multi-component mixtures and when we calculate everything we want, the momentum distribution, for example, all correlation function, is just that we have to keep track of the fact that this is a degeneracy manifold. And also, I do not uh, resist to tell you also that uh, for, we can also characterize the symmetry of each state. And this because we use uh, an operator that is called the class sum operator. Maybe you've met in theoretical physics. For example, the class sum operator of order two is the sum of all the permutation of two particles. And then if you want to know the symmetry of the ground state, you calculate the expectation value of uh, your state on, the, on this operator represented on the same snippet basis. And, uh, uh, but uh, the last point of this lecture is to show you that we can map to an effect in the two component case to an effective spin model or in the general case to the permutations. In fact, that's what we want to do. Uh, for any state uh, psi and uh, psi prime, we want uh, to show that the expectation value of diagonal of the Hamiltonian to these states uh, can be written as well as the uh, this uh, amplitude times the expectation value of sum over all the uh, snippets indices 1 to d of some effective Hamiltonian. And I want to find a, a, a Hamilton, effective Hamiltonian. So I want to see how I write the Hamiltonian on the snippet basis. And then I guess I will answer your question on uh, what type of symmetry it is. And maybe you will teach me actually <laughs> which one it is in your language. So, uh, well, to do that uh, is actually exactly the same calculation that we had up there, but in particular between a, um, a given snippet sector and another snippet sector. So each, uh, way, each state, uh, way, the, the wave function of each state, of course, has uh, a part uh, associated to the uh, snippet vectors. So we have, uh, is written like that in general. So um, that means that I, I want just to integrate out the spatial part, all this x1 to xn, and I want to read out what it means in terms of the permutations. And, uh, um, So to do that, then uh, if I use psi and psi prime done like that, uh, I am left with calculating, for example, um, the uh, uh, calculating, for example, some integrals of the type uh, psi star on a given uh, psi, uh, the um, ah sorry, and all this, of course, is again to order one over G. I'm not going to do the mapping exactly for any interaction. It's this in the strong coupling only. In this uh, way, we have that Psi H Psi prime is the one at uh, infinite interactions. That will be just a constant. And then this uh, one over G and then the expectation value on uh, of the interaction part of the Hamiltonian. <coughs> and uh, in general, I will have uh, here a, 
let me go here. In general, we'll have here, for example, a state corresponding to the permutation sector P. Then I will have uh, some deltas, a state permutation P prime. But in fact, thanks to the permutation symmetry of this interaction term, I can reduce myself of calculating just, uh, you see, you know that uh, you com can, um, um, the composition of two permutations is another permutation. And so all this type of matrix element, in fact, are equivalent of just calculating uh, the one between here the identity and here an arbitrary permutation. It will be the same. And now I see the effect of this delta potential on this type of permutation that starts from the identity. And uh, I see that uh, I have to calculate again all the overlap integrals like that one, but in this case the psi are just restricted to on a, on a single uh, small theta term or snippet or even a subset of a snippet, a single permutation. And uh, so the permutation Q that is connected to the identity is just the one where Either Q is the identity itself, or is the permutation between one particle and the next one. Because if I, in the first sector, I have X1, X2, X3, X4, and I, if I want to move out from this to go to a new permutation by just exchanging two particles, I just can exchange one with two, two with three, or three with four, and that's all. Otherwise, I have zero overlap. So that means that uh, uh, the effective Hamiltonian is the following. You have a constant that is the energy at uh, infinite uh, interaction. Uh, you, uh, the, the contribution coming from this identity will be uh, this minus alpha i. Uh, let me denote by j i alpha i, i plus one over g. The alphas are the one which enter there. So I will get this and it is an identity in the snippet space. And then I have another term that is sine plus sum over j i of pi i plus one. Okay, so this is the most general if, uh, representation of the Hamiltonian of our problem onto the snippet basis. And now, if we have uh, uh, two component systems, then you know that the permutation can be written in terms of products of Pauli matrices, like that, pi i plus one is one half, and then let's not do the things wrong. The Pauli matrix is sigma i product, scalar product sigma i plus one plus the identity of the, in the two by two space. The, so the identity of the Pauli or sigma zero, you may call it. So this shows that the initial, for the two component case, the initial problem is mapped on the spin problem uh, uh, this is known as the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. And uh, um, the coefficients that enter here depend on the i, on the index. And remember for us, this uh, i index is the particle index. So we are mapping the initial problem in the continuum to a lattice problem where the lattice index is the particle index. And uh, for the two component, uh, it's this uh, spin, spin. If you have three components, you have to use uh, the representation of the permutations for a three color system. So then you have to use the uh, Gelman matrices, lambda. And uh, this is, uh, okay, this is the most rigorous uh, way I know to show you which symmetry it is. And then you tell me in your own language how you see it. 
But, and uh, notice that indeed the dimension of this Smith snippet space is exactly the dimension of the space we need for the high, for example, for this case, for the Heisenberg model for uh, um, N particles. So um, I think I should uh, stop here if you have questions. So this is uh, uh, the, the main final results for SU, SUN or whatever, multi-component mixtures and I wait for your questions. Yes. So, so for the two component problem where you have these snippets, what is the symmetry? What is the symmetry? Yes, thanks. Fantastic question. Um, this uh, actually I can answer for uh, any any general mixture. So the symmetry of the ground state follows. So was uh, was uh, anticipated by Lieb and Mattis. It's a famous theorem. Uh, it shows that the, the uh, state of the system for uh, um, two spin component fermions is antiferromagnetic. So that is, uh, it has the uh, lowest possible total spin as is uh, given by the given mixer. So, for example, if you have the same number of up and down, then it will be a singlet. But you, if you have an imbalanced mixture, you have to create the, most, the, the lowest spin state for that mixture. And in our way of analyzing and writing um, with the exact solution, um, we work in a sort of a dual uh, representation, and for us, is the most symmetric young tableau which corresponds to the ground state. And uh, we actually checked that this is true also for multi higher order multi-component mixtures. So it can be generalized to, um, our, to several higher multi-component mixtures. And there is also a, a theorem that I have found, but mathematical theorem that mentions this uh, generalization of lieb mattis to multi-component and again is the most, uh, so the antiferromagnetic. And then maybe as an exercise, which is, uh, you can also think of what happens for Bose-Bose mixtures. Now change the statistics of the particles, change the symmetry under exchange uh, uh, within the particles of the same color, and think what it would change, and then you can also answer that question. And actually, that is a second theorem by Lieb about uh, Bose-Bose mixtures. <laughs>